This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 26, coming up on Space Time. China's Tiangong-1 space station crashes back to Earth. Discovery of a galaxy without dark matter. And could cosmic rays provide new clues about the very nature of dark matter? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. China's out-of-control Tiangong-1 space station has crashed back to Earth in a fiery re-entry, slamming down in the South Pacific Ocean near Tahiti. The bus-sized space station has been violently tumbling out of control for the last two years, ever since Beijing mission managers suddenly lost contact with the vehicle back in March 2016. However, China didn't admit there was a problem until a couple of amateur satellite spotters detected it a couple of months later and raised the alarm. Even so, it wasn't until September that Beijing finally admitted that they had lost control of their space station. The United Nations then requested the European Space Agency to monitor the situation from their control room in Darmstadt, Germany. ESA collaborated with other space agencies and with the United States Strategic Command's Joint Space Operations Center at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California in order to maintain close tracking of the doomed spacecraft. The Joint Space Operations Center includes personnel from all four U.S. services, Air Force, Army, Navy and Marines, as well as Australia, the United Kingdom and Canada. Its mission is to plan and execute command and control of worldwide space forces. By late March, Tiangong-1 had dropped below 250 kilometres. By comparison, the International Space Station usually orbits the planet at around 400 kilometres. Then last week, Tiangong-1 dropped below 200 kilometres and its rate of orbital decay was increasing as the spacecraft was being subjected to increasing amounts of atmospheric drag as it began to be buffeted by the rarefied upper layers of Earth's atmosphere, slowing it down at an ever-increasing rate. And as the spacecraft slows, it also loses altitude. The situation became critical in the morning of April 2nd Australian time when it became clear that Tiangong-1's end was near. On what turned out to be its fourth last orbit, the 8.5-ton spacecraft dropped 2.5 kilometres to below 120 kilometres in altitude, and that triggered the issuing of worldwide warnings to governments to monitor the situation closely. While there was little chance of the spacecraft crashing to a populated area, that couldn't be ruled out, and worse still, it was still too early to know exactly where the final impact point was likely to be. On what would be its third last orbit, the spacecraft dropped by another 7 kilometres, quickly followed by a further drop of 10 kilometres on the next orbit. By this time, the space station's solar arrays had already been torn off and the spacecraft was starting to break apart. By now, it was clear that China's first space station was on its final orbit and Ground Zero was likely to be somewhere in the South Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. Dr Brad Tucker from the Australian National University says much of the 10.5 metre long spacecraft would have burnt up during atmospheric re-entry, with only some of the major components making it all the way down to the surface. It crashed in the remote southern central Pacific Ocean where most of these things go to land. We do know it crashed down about 10.15 local time, uh, Australian time, about 100 kilometres northwest of Tahiti. So it did crash in the remote central southern Pacific Ocean. Tell me about the physics of re-entry. What happens to uh, something like a space station when it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. When does it start to heat up? When does it start to break apart? What's the timeline for something like that? So really, when it hits to the 100-kilometer mark, that's when things start to happen. By 140 kilometers, you start to get excess drag. So Tiangong dropped every orbit 2.5 kilometers and 7 and 10 kilometers, which is a lot. When it hits the 100-kilometer mark, that's when it starts to heat up. You get more friction. And then by doing nearly one more complete orbit, you drop to about another 20 kilometers, which is about to 80, 75 kilometers or so, that's when you really are heating up, the friction's wearing on you, and you're starting to break apart. And then from that point, then it's about 10 to 15 minutes uh, of breaking apart and re-entry that it occurs. And during all this, the flight path changes too from a uh, what still looks like an orbital flight path, even though it's on a steep descent, to what really is, uh, would it be called a parabolic curve straight down? Or That's right, exactly. So instead of, you know, imagine a plane 
you're, you're, you know, there's a difference between colliding into the runway and then really coming shortly down. And that's the difference between how it starts to descend into orbit, where it's really gliding, slowly descending, and, and then taking that sharp downward turn. And that's as the speed dramatically decreases, it falls faster, which creates more friction, which causes it to fall faster, and so on. So there's a quick point of no return that it just essentially collides. That's Dr. Brad Tucker from the Australian National University. Crews from both the Shenzhou 9 and Shenzhou 10 capsules visited the orbiting outpost. It was designed to be a stepping stone to a much larger space station due to be launched in 2020 and eventually mining bases on the moon. Jonathan Nowley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, says the space station was supposed to undertake a controlled re-entry, but even the best laid plans sometimes go wrong. It's a large spacecraft, that's why it's um, sort of getting a lot of attention, but defunct satellites do come down quite often. For a long, long time, for decades in fact, the sort of manufacturers of rockets and satellites and the space agencies involved and in charge of these things have been you know, putting a lot of effort into not having things go out of control in space and end up ending up as space junk. Um, they pref- much prefer these days to um, make controlled re-entries of, of spacecraft um, and make them burn up safely in the atmosphere so they don't crash into each other up there in space and cause more junk or just get in the way. Or sometimes they will boost a satellite into a much, much higher orbit that will mean it will be up there for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years or something. So they've been putting a lot of effort into making sure the spacecraft don't go out of control, but sometimes they do. And this one has. And, of course, it reminds us all of Skylab back in 1979, which was the American space station. And the reason it went out of control was that uh, the original plan was the space shuttle was going to come along years earlier than it eventually did. And they were going to go up with the space shuttle and basically attach a big rocket pack to the side of Skylab, which would be able to boost it up into a higher orbit and then when the time came would be able to deorbit it in a controlled manner and make it burn up in the atmosphere in a, in a particular spot where it wouldn't do any harm. Because the space shuttle program was delayed by many years, they weren't able to do that and therefore uh, Skylab ran out of its own little thrust of fuel supplies and uh, they lost control of it and yeah, it came down in 1979. Most of it came into the Indian Ocean but some of it hit Western Australia. No one was hurt, which is good. Which <laughs> I mean, you've got to be unlucky. You'd have to be very unlucky to be hit by anything, uh, whether it's Skylab or this Chinese one or anything else. But yeah, they, they do prefer to bring them down to controlled manner. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And you're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a galaxy missing most, if not all, of its dark matter. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, challenge currently accepted theories of galaxy formation and provide new insights into the nature of dark matter. Scientists have no idea what dark matter is. They know it exists because they can see its gravitational influence on normal matter, preventing galaxies from spinning apart as they rotate. Therefore, it's conventionally believed that dark matter is an integral part of all galaxies. It's the glue that holds them together and the underlying scaffolding upon which they're built. Observations show there must be at least four times as much dark matter in the universe as what there is normal or baryonic matter. The stuff stars, planets, moons, buildings, people and even radios are made from. Scientists made their new revelations about dark matter while studying the relatively nearby galaxy NGC 1052 DF2, located about 65 million light years away in the constellation Cetus. Astronomers were using the Dragonfly telephoto array to study the galaxy. Now, this galaxy had already been catalogued, but researchers noticed that it looked quite different in the Dragonfly images. When they examined it more closely, they found that NGC 1052 DF2 is actually larger than the Milky Way, but it contains some 250 times fewer stars, making it what astronomers call an ultra-diffuse galaxy. A 2015 survey of the Coma Galaxy Cluster showed that these large faint objects are actually quite common. But none of the ultra-diffuse galaxies found so far, other than this one, have been found to be lacking in dark matter. So even among this unusual class of galaxies, NGC 1052 DF2 is an oddball. The study's lead author, Peter Van Dockham from Yale University, describes it as being literally a see-through galaxy, an astonishingly gigantic ghostly blob so sparse that you can see the galaxies behind it. Things got even more interesting when the authors measured the dynamical properties of 10 globular clusters orbiting the galaxy using the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Globular clusters are tightly gravitationally bound spheres containing tens of thousands to maybe even millions of stars. 
They were all originally formed at the same time in the same collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud. And by observing the motions of these globular clusters, the astronomers were able to determine the mass of the galaxy itself. To do this, they used Kepler's second law, which states that the rotation velocities of stars will decrease with distance from the centre of a galaxy. They found that the clusters were moving at relatively low speeds, less than 37,000 kilometres per hour. Stars and galaxies containing dark matter usually move at least three times faster. Now, that means NGC 1052 DF2 contains at least 400 times less dark matter than what it should have, and possibly none at all. The authors then turned to NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and the Gemini North Observatory in Hawaii in order to uncover more details about this unique galaxy. The Gemini observations revealed the galaxy doesn't show any signs of an interaction with another galaxy, while Hubble helped them better identify the globular clusters and measure an accurate distance to the galaxy. The Hubble images also revealed the galaxy's unusual appearance. Not only doesn't this ghostly galaxy have a noticeable central region, astronomers couldn't even find spiral arms or a disk, features which are typical of a spiral galaxy. But the thing is, it doesn't look like an elliptical galaxy either. And the galaxy also shows no evidence that it houses a central black hole. Now, based on the colours of its globular clusters, scientists think this galaxy is about 10 billion years old. And even the globular clusters are eyeballs, as they're twice as large as typical stellar groupings seen in other galaxies. Finding a galaxy without any dark matter is completely unexpected. In fact, it challenges the standard ideas of how galaxies work. So there is no theory that predicts these types of galaxies. And although it sounds counterintuitive, the very existence of a galaxy without dark matter negates theories that try to explain the universe without dark matter being a part of it. You see, modified Newtonian dynamics, or MON theory, suggests that the phenomena which is usually attributed to dark matter can be explained if you modify the laws of gravity. The result of this would be that a signature usually attributed to dark matter would always be detected anyway, and is an unavoidable consequence of the presence of ordinary or baryonic matter. The discovery of NGC 1052 DF2 also demonstrates that dark matter is somehow separable from galaxies. Now, this is only expected if dark matter is bound to ordinary matter through nothing but gravity. The discovery has broad implications for astrophysics, showing for the first time ever that dark matter isn't always associated with traditional matter on a galactic scale. Now, this rules out several current theories that dark matter isn't really a substance, but simply a manifestation of the laws of gravity on a cosmic scale. Van Dockham says scientists had thought that every galaxy should have dark matter, and that dark matter is in fact how galaxies actually begin. In fact, this invisible mysterious substance is the most dominant aspect of any galaxy, so finding a galaxy without it is completely unexpected. Not only does it challenge the standard ideas of how we think galaxies work, but it also shows that dark matter is real. It has its own separate existence apart from the other components of galaxies. The results also suggest that there must be more than one way for a galaxy to form. The lack of dark matter in NGC 1052 DF2 could have been caused by a sudden starburst producing a multitude of massive stars, each of which are giving off tremendous amounts of radiation and stellar wind, enough to sweep out all the gas, and as it turns out dark matter as well, from the galaxy. And because all the evidence suggests that dark matter only interacts gravitationally with ordinary matter, as all this ordinary matter is being blown out of the galaxy by these stars, the dark matter is simply following it. Another possibility is that NGC 1052DF2 resides in a collection of galaxies, all of which are dominated by a giant central elliptical galaxy known as NGC 1052. So, it's possible that the growth of the nearby massive elliptical galaxy NGC 1052 is playing a role in NGC 1052DF2's dark matter deficiency. Another possibility is that gas moving towards the giant elliptical NGC 1052 may simply have fragmented to form NGC 1052 DF2, or that the formation of NGC 1052 DF2 may have been helped by powerful winds emanating from a young black hole that was growing at the heart of the bigger NGC 1052 galaxy. The study's authors are now searching for more dark matter deficient galaxies, as they analyse Hubble images of 23 ultra-diffuse galaxies, three of which appear to be similar to NGC 1052 DF2. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Physicists studying unusual cosmic X-ray emissions say it could be a sign that dark matter is composed of sterile neutrinos. 
The findings, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, could help solve the dark matter mystery which has been plaguing science for almost a century. The most favoured candidate for dark matter's composition are something called WIMPs, or weakly interactive massive particles. WIMPs would be new types of subatomic-sized particles, things like the hypothetical axion. And physicists at facilities like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and the Grand Sasso Laboratory in Italy have been searching for these particles for years. However, the detection back in 2014 of unexplained spectral signatures in cosmic X-ray emissions with an energy of 3.5 kiloelectron volts coming from distant galaxies and galaxy clusters have sent some researchers on a different path. Scientists have hypothesized that dark matter particles might decay during collisions, emitting X-ray radiation in the process. And that's caused some researchers to speculate that just possibly dark matter particles might be very different from what was always previously assumed. One of this new study's authors, Professor Joachim Kopp from Mance University, has proposed a scenario in which two dark matter particles collide, resulting in their mutual annihilation. This is analogous to what happens when matter and antimatter meet. They annihilate each other, emitting gamma-ray radiation. Kopp says it's long been assumed that it would not be possible to observe such annihilations of dark matter if this substance was made out of particles that light. So, Kopp and colleagues developed a new model for dark matter which they say fits together nicely when compared to experimental data from older models. Their new model suggests that dark matter particles could be the long-hypothesized fermion or mass particle known as a sterile neutrino, which would have a tiny mass of only a few kiloelectron volts. Now, such a lightweight dark matter particle is usually considered problematic because it makes it difficult to explain how galaxies could have formed. Kopp says his team's new models deal with these concerns and provide an elegant way out. The model suggests dark matter annihilation is a two-step process, in which an intermediate state is first formed, which then later disintegrates into the observed X-ray photons. According to Kopp, the calculations showed that the resulting X-ray signature correlates closely with the 2014 spectral X-ray observations. He says at the same time the new model itself is so general that it offers an interesting starting point in the search for dark matter, even if it turns out that the spectral line discovered in 2014 has a different origin. Physicists are now working on the proposed European Space Agency e-Astrogram mission, which aims to analyse astrophysical X-ray radiation with previously unachieved accuracy. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now for a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. In the wake of massive expulsions of Russian diplomats following the nerve agent attack on former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Vladimir Putin has conducted a North Korean-style show of force, test-firing the Kremlin's new RS-28 Sermat intercontinental ballistic missile. The missile, which goes by the NATO codename Satan-2, was launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in northwestern Russia near the Arctic Circle. The new ICBM is designed to replace Moscow's ageing Soviet-era martyr of SS-18 Satan missiles, which currently still form the basis of its nuclear deterrent. The development of this new liquid-fueled rocket has been underway since 2009. The RS-28 Surmat is a big rocket with a large payload capacity, able to carry up to 10 tonnes. Now that's enough for up to 10 MIRVs, that's multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle warheads, or 15 lighter 350 kiloton yield warheads, or 24 avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicles, which are ramjet-powered nuclear-tipped cruise missiles. Or the RS-28 is flexible enough to take any combination of those. The missile is also equipped with a range of electronic countermeasures designed to defeat anti-missile systems. The silo launch CERMAT only has a short boost phase, limiting the amount of time it can be tracked by spy satellites using infrared sensors to detect the heat signature of the rocket's exhaust plume, making it harder to intercept. It's also speculated that the RS-28 could fly a trajectory over the South Pole, completely bypassing many of America's current missile defence systems. Now, if correct, that means it also has fractional orbital bombardment capability, meaning it spends at least part of its journey time in low Earth orbit. Vladimir Putin says mass production of the new 220-ton missile will begin in 2020, with the weapon becoming fully operational a year later. Analysis of a 102 million year old fossil of an ancient crocodile from Queensland suggests the reptile lived in a salty river delta. The findings, reported in the journal Royal Society Open Science, suggest this river flowed into an ancient inland sea in what is now central western Queensland. 
Paleontologists compared the fossils with patterns of decay seen in modern crocodile carcasses in order to try out how the fossil was formed. They say it's likely this animal was buried in sediment-laden flood waters in the River Delta. Well, just as in the 1970s, most Australian households grew rapidly from just a single TV in the lounge room to multiple TVs spread throughout the home, including the kitchen and each bedroom. Now, the average Australian home contains at least six devices capable of connecting to the internet. The findings by the Australian Bureau of Statistics are up from an average of 5.8 three years ago. The new data shows that some 87% of Australians are now internet users. It's probably no surprise to learn that kids and teenagers are the biggest users at 98%, while the over 65s are the lowest at just 55%. On the downside, the Bureau of Stats also found that some 14% of connected homes with young kids aged 5 to 14 had seen one of their kids exposed to inappropriate material online, and 5% had kids subjected to cyberbullying. Australia's 87% internet usage compares to the US on 89%, the UK on 93%, Japan on 91%, New Zealand on 90%, Germany on 88%, and Canada on 86%. The highest internet usage was located in Iceland at 100%. Well, there's not much else to do there, let's face it. Well, the lowest was Eritrea, with just 1.1% of the population online. Scientists have identified a previously unknown feature of the human anatomy, with implications for the functions of all organs, most tissues, and the mechanisms of most major diseases. The discovery, published in the journal Scientific Reports, indicates layers of the body, long thought to be dense connective tissue below the skin's surface, lining the digestive tract, lungs and urinary systems, and surrounding arteries, veins and the fascia between muscles, are all actually interconnected fluid-filled compartments. This series of spaces, supported by a meshwork of strong collagen and flexible elastin connective tissue proteins, may act like shock absorbers, keeping tissues from tearing as organs, muscles and vessels squeeze, pump and pulse as part of daily function. Importantly, scientists also say this layer acts as a highway for moving fluid, which may explain why cancer that invades it becomes much more likely to spread. The newfound network drains into the lymphatic system, the source of lymph, the fluid vital for the functioning of immune cells that generate inflammation. Furthermore, the cells that reside in the space and the collagen bundles they line change with age and may contribute to the wrinkling of skin, the stiffening of limbs and the progression of some diseases. No one noticed these spaces before because of the way researchers study tissue on microscope slides which drain away the fluid, causing the structure to flatten. A new study has found that the longest animal in the world, the bootlace worm, which can be up to 55 metres long, produces neurotoxins that can kill arthropods from crabs to cockroaches. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, could lead to new toxins for use in agricultural insecticides. In fact, the worm's peptide toxin is the most poisonous substance yet found in the animal kingdom. Scientists already know that peptide toxins are found in cone shells that live in tropical waters. But these bootlace ribbon worms live in colder waters, such as the coastlines of Great Britain and Norway and on the west coast of Sweden. Up till now, few studies have been done on the chemistry of ribbon worms. But researchers found that when the worm's irritated, it releases huge amounts of thick mucus that's poisonous for crustaceans. Toxins often affect the ionic channels, that is, proteins that control the transport of different ions in and out of cells. Scientists found that this new isolated toxin impedes the inactivation of sodium channels, causing continuous electrical signaling in nerves and muscles, resulting in paralysis. When I first began as a radio disc jockey, I soon found out that for sound quality, Sennheiser headphones set the standard by which all other on-air studio headphones are judged. And I still use them today, but the thing is, Sennheisers are far too delicate, and so they're easily damaged. And so I also keep a pair of Audio-Technica around, which I find far more robust. In fact, I'm wearing them now. But the thing is, Sennheiser and Audio-Technica studio headphones are simply too big and cumbersome to use on the streets. So when I'm on the move, I used to use Dr. Dre Beats earbuds. But again, they turned out to be easily damaged, left in the bottom of a bag or something, and constantly replacing them got old really fast. So I ended up sacrificing audio quality on the move for something that's not going to break. And if they do, cheap enough that you just won't care. Now, Apple have announced plans for new high-end earbuds. 
With the details, we're joined by Alex Ahar of Reut from IT Wire. There's a rumour has come out that Apple is now going to launch a new set of noise cancelling over-the-ear headphones, a bit like the ones from people like Bose or Plantronics or a range of other companies. And what they're saying is that this would have the same sort of chip inside of these headphones, the W1 chip, that would effortlessly connect to all of the iPhones and iPads, but also would have the standard Bluetooth technology that would connect to other Android devices. So, you know, it just makes sense that if Apple is going to make its already existing wide range of Beats headphones that they would have a, a high-end noise cancelling model because the one from Bose, for example, and companies like Plantronics and Sony and others, I mean, the talk is that Apple will release their own and they'll have this W1 chip and it's a pretty easy prediction to make. Alex Sahar of Roy from IT Wire reporting. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.